Hi, everyone. I'm Lloyd Lewis. I'm the board co-chair at CCDC and CEO of the Arc Thrift Stores. Additionally, I chair the Atlantis Community Foundation Board and the Colorado Disability Funding Committee. While we're waiting for everyone to join, I just wanted to start with some thoughts on CCDC and ADA. CCDC is the only statewide organization run by and for people with all types of disabilities. This focus at CCDC is social justice for all with disabilities. We work both inside and outside of systems. We are disability led and we have the resilience built into our community as a result. Uh, our work as CCDC is made possible by the many volunteer advocates, foundations, individual donors, and a great staff and board of directors. It's a team effort, but our team can always grow. There's room for everyone interested to be involved. If you're not a member, please join today. Our website is ccdconline.org. Membership is free, but we're happy to take donations. On ADA, which we're here to celebrate, it is the most significant civil rights law for people with disabilities in history. Like any civil rights law, it only works to the extent that we enforce it. It's a floor, not a ceiling, and real accessibility is going way above and way beyond. ADA, as you know, was written in the 80s and passed in 1990. But the world has changed and we need changes in law to match. Creating website accessibility is one of those changes. Now we have that in Colorado law and hope the rest of the country will follow. If people think the ADA did not make a difference, talk to those who lived with a disability before ADA. And while we have a long way to go to get to equality, it truly is much better now. Transportation is a great example, going from no access at all to 100% accessibility and that happened based on a law, the ADA, plus enforcement, which is where CCDC came in. Um, I want to talk just a little bit about how I got involved. So I have a wonderful son, Kennedy Lewis, who will turn 18 in August, who has Down syndrome. And uh, with Kennedy's birth, I became involved in this wonderful community and advocacy effort. I joined the Arc Thrift Stores in 2005. And I'm proud to say that we have become the largest funder of advocacy for people with intellectual disabilities in the state of Colorado, well over $100 million during my tenure. And I'm very proud to say that we are one of the largest employers of people with disabilities in Colorado. We've hired 350 great employees with disabilities during my tenure, and we'll be adding 20 or 30 uh, new employees with disabilities each and every year and they have made a great difference uh, for our organization. And I don't know if you saw it, but there was a wonderful um, White House gathering by President Biden uh, signing a proclamation acknowledging um, the Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, he talked about his pride in being a co-sponsor. House leadership was there, Senate leadership was there. He talked about Tom Harkin's contributions. Ted Kennedy's contributions. He talked about the many disability champions who made a tremendous difference in employment, transportation, uh, in public accommodations. He talked about the importance of dignity and equity for our community. He talked with pride about uh, Senator Harkin signing in speech to his brother on the floor when um, the Senate passed that bill. He talked with pride about Bob Dole and his support uh, as a person with a disability that he experienced in World War II. He talked about the importance of opportunity and in independent living for 60 million Americans living with disabilities. He talked about his executive orders, the appointment of a White House disability advocate, and that in every policy he would have disability in mind. He talked about the federal government becoming a model employer, and then he signed the proclamation. And I think it's significant that we had that kind of attention to our anniversary by the president of our country and all of the pride that he took in this particular bill. And if you get a chance, look for a recording of that bill. Um, we are thrilled, uh, Arc Thrift Stores, to sponsor the CC documentary, Our Resilient Community, which you'll be seeing uh, in just a little bit. And we're very excited to welcome uh, good friends, Colorado State Representatives Leslie Herod and David Ortiz to our program. 
And now Julie Riskin, our executive director, will do a formal introduction, have a wonderful celebration event on this very important uh, anniversary. Thank you. Thank you, Lloyd, and, and thank you to ARC Thrift Stores for, for your sponsorship. So I'm very honored to uh, introduce uh, my own personal state representative from the best house district in the state, um, House District 8, Leslie Harrod, who was a winner of this award two years ago um, for her great work champ championing equity for everyone and including people with disabilities without having to be asked. And so we thought it fitting that um, Representative Harrod could um, present this year's award to um, Representative David Ortiz, who uh, sponsored our priority bill this year um, and is the first wheelchair using state representative in Colorado. I think both Representative um, Harrod and Ortiz are, are live demonstrations of how much representation matters. So, um, I'd like to also give a shout out to the Access Gallery um, who does our awards for us. They're a wonderful art gallery um, run um, of people with, with all types of disabilities, um, which is another expression of the pride and beauty in our community. So um, Representative Harrod, if you could uh, unmute yourself and come on um, and present the award, that would be awesome. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for that introduction, Julie. Um, I'm definitely not going to argue with you. House District 8 is the best house district in the state of Colorado. Um, there are some that are very close seconds, though, and uh, uh, mostly in representation. And that definitely is Representative Ortiz's district. Um, I got to say, when I received this award, I was pretty um, surprised and shocked um, because I hadn't really felt like I had gone above and beyond for the community. I just basically did what Julie asked me to do, um, which was to um, remember uh, the disab disability community in every single thing that we do. And I did that. Um, and also to support wherever else I could. Um, and so for me, as a woman of color, as a queer woman, um, know that tune, right? I'm saying that too. You gotta make sure that we're being inclusive. Um, and as much as folks try to, the best person to lead on policies of inclusivity are those with true lived experience. And so um, for me as a queer person and as a black person and as a woman, I do great in those areas. Um, but for someone who does not have um, a disability uh, such as a, uh, you know, such as a disability like, like Representative Ortiz has, um, I cannot represent that community well enough. You know, there are things that I just don't know or think about. And that's real. And quite frankly, I think the uh, importance of being an ally is understanding and figuring out what you don't know and stepping back when it's time for someone else to roll in front of you, right? And that's what Representative Ortiz has taught me and does. And so I remember when Representative Ortiz was, was uh, campaigning. It's probably one of the hardest uh, working campaigners of that election cycle and one that I've seen to date. Um, wouldn't take no for an answer. Uh, I don't think slept very much and was always either knocking doors or gaining support and under trying, to gain, trying to gain understanding wherever he could. And I just remember, I was already on the team, I remember when I went into the Capitol, um, I, I tend to work from there because it's so close to my district during the interim and they were installing ramps. And I was like, David, I think you're gonna win this. I mean, I think there's some information out there and you got this covered. And I thought, why the heck didn't we have this there before? You know what I mean? And as an advocate, I never thought to say anything. Why not? I mean, it's quite frankly absurd. Um, and so the lived experience that Representative Ortiz brings to the Capitol is completely unmatched and unparalleled. And the reason why we have had so many gains in this area is singularly because Representative Ortiz is there as a direct representation of his constituents, but also this organization as well. And as hard as y'all have worked to make sure that you are represented, I think it's amazing that you now have a champion in there with lived experience as well. And I think you can see that in the laws that were that were passed, right? Like I don't have this experience, so I didn't know that all these websites weren't accessible. Right. Like you might not see things through my eyes. So you might not hear, you know, the racism or discrimination that exists within some of our statutes or language either. 
right? And so it's important that we learn from each other. And that's what I've done with Representative Ortiz. I got to tell you, working with him has been amazing. Not only is he a champion for the disabilities community, he is a, cha and a champion for us all, Black, Brown, queer, indigenous, anyone who needs a voice, Representative Ortiz is proud to lift up his voice in their honor or to step back and support them when it's time for their voices to shine. So I got, I can't say enough, as you can tell, about what I think about Representative Ortiz. And David, we haven't talked recently, but I was in the Capitol last week and I saw that they were installing lifts to the podium so that you can chair the committee of the whole next year, which is something again, that should have happened a long time ago that didn't, you are truly our champion. I could not think of anyone better for this award. I expect that you get it every year for the next 25 years, because I know how hard you work in these areas and what you do every single day by living your truth. It is my honor to present you with this award. And now my honor to introduce Representative David Ortiz, my dear friend. Thanks for having me, everyone. All right, I wanna start off by thanking um, Representative Hare. My internet's spotty, so I'm just gonna try and speak briefly. But I, I wanna thank her so much um, because not only is she presenting or introducing me and helping present this award to me, but she's been one of the greatest mentors that I've had at the state capitol. Um, you all know she's been an ally and a champion for equity in all areas, especially for the black and brown communities and for the LGBTQ plus community, but also for us living with a disability. And I can't even begin to enumerate the things that I have learned from sitting behind her, not to mention the laughs that I've had um, from sitting behind her, but also just as a freshman legislator. So I want to start off by first and foremost, thanking Representative Harrod for everything that she's taught me and everything that she's been this year. Um, I also want to acknowledge uh, the artist who created this award, Javier Flores. And I really want to thank you for being an example that I can relate to. And whether we're talking about being a first generation American like I am, or becoming a part of this disability tribe later in life, um, much like I did, it's amazing to experience the emotions of your journey through your artwork. So thank you. Um, I'll also go into saying that the best way to express what this community and this tribe and this award means for me is to go back to the heart of why I do this work. And as an elected vet that lives with a disability, I don't know the reason why um, I got to come home when some of my other brothers and sisters didn't. Uh, but at the beginning of this journey, I'll be honest with you, I'd wish that I had died in that crash often. Um, and really that speaks to the kind of ableism that a lot of us able-bodied, I, I mean, past able-bodied, me for me, individuals bring to this community, just because you don't know the obstacles that you have to go through or what exists until you live this life. Uh, the very fact that I wish that says, uh, when I came to this injury, says how long of a way we needed to go. I mean, whether we're talking about that or getting out and about when I was regaining my independence and seeing how bathrooms weren't accessible or seeing how businesses weren't accessible. Or um, the fact that, you know, my first interaction with a state senator when I was an advocate lobbyist for veterans was what did you do to yourself? As if that's the only reason or way that you could come to this injury. Um, and for the other reasons that Rep. had mentioned, you know, finally making the house floor accessible, finally making the dais accessible, um, you know, un really paint how critical this community and tribe have become to me and how critical they've been in helping me see past my own ableism uh, when I came to this injury. Um, so without that, um, you know, I would not have been able to do the work that I did this year. And a very special thanks to Joanne Rusha, Julie Reskin and Scott Labar, um, because, because of their work in supporting me as the sponsor, we got the first in the nation uh, of law of its type fighting for web accessibility, the Colorado law for people with disabilities. Um, so bec because of all that and more, I wanna thank you all. Um, I look forward to continue working with you all to keep this going. I mean, we're working, uh, or we're having this award ceremony on the 31st anniversary of ADA and it has been a godsend and a good benchmark, but anybody that lives this life knows that it's not enough and we're not done. Uh, so because of that and more, I wanna thank you all. I look forward to working with you all and continuing to make sure that we're fighting for equity, especially when it comes for those that live with a disability. So thank you. Thank you, um, Representative Ortiz and Representative Herod. We're gonna pop up the artwork um, and um, so people can see its beauty. Um, so uh, this is Julie Riskin again. And um, I just want to say a couple words before we get to see this amazing video. Um, so one of the most um, amazing parts of my job is that I get to be engrossed with what I think is the coolest community anywhere. 
uh, the Colorado disability community has really been a rock through this difficult time. And it's not just the, just the past you know, year or 16 months, but it's, it, th things have been difficult for a while. And I wanna just take a minute first to thank the incredible staff and board of CCDC, uh, because everything we do is only possible because of good governance and good work. As you'll see in the video, um, which is all about the resilience of our community, you know, we, we all kept going. Um, when the pandemic first hit, I started getting calls from reporters asking about what does the disability community need? And I kept saying, we can talk about that, but first I wanna talk about what we can give and what is our resilience. We have people in our community who before COVID have had to live at home often in bed for a year or more, people who have had medical issues. We've, we have lots of people who learned how to survive sudden poverty and sudden income loss. We already knew how to do work from home. We've been doing it for years. Um, our community is nothing if not adaptable, and, but what I saw went even beyond that. What I saw is our community using our natural strengths and gifts to benefit everyone, especially those most at risk for the devastating consequences from COVID, which certainly included people with disabilities, but particularly people in congregate settings and uh, black and brown people and low income people. As always, we were the canaries in the coal mine. Uh, for people who don't know that analogy, I'm dating myself. In, in coal, coal mining, the canaries were, were sent into the coal mine and if they lived, they would come out. And if they didn't live, it would be too dangerous to go in. Um, when we thought our hospitals might run out of ventilators, we jumped in right away and educated the medical professionals and policymakers. And because of our advocacy came up, with, thank God we didn't come to that in Colorado. Uh, yet, um, but we came up with a fair policy that not only didn't look at irrelevant disabilities when deciding if we were going to have to ration care, how that happened, but also excluded race, immigration status, criminal background, uh, and class, so that the people making the decisions would do so without ever having information on any of those things that could bias them, even an unconscious bias. When everything became drive through only, it was our community that sounded the alarm saying that drive-through only leaves out a lot of people who don't have a vehicle. And that's much more than those of us who don't drive. We helped make sure that PPE was supplied. We advocated that bus drivers got PPE because initially we weren't, they weren't getting it um, and other essential workers. We then advocate and continue to advocate for vaccine equity and continue to advocate for the vaccine, which I think, hope everyone knows is safe, effective and saves lives and is free and very widely available. Throughout the pandemic, we kept doing our other work. We helped people answer the census and promoted that along with lots of other of our nonprofit partners. And because of our work, we now have one more congressperson to, to bug or we will. Throughout the pandemic, we did voter education, outreach, we published a voter guide and encouraged people to engage in virtual volunteering for the candidates of their choice. We don't yet know the numbers on the disability vote um, but we do for 2020 in Colorado, but we expect it'll be good. In 2018, people with disabilities in Colorado actually voted at a slightly higher rate than non-disabled people. We got involved in ballot issues, supporting some and opposing others. We didn't win everything, but are very thrilled that paid sick leave passed. We work closely with our state Medicaid agency, co-hosting co -hosting regular webinars to make sure everyone knew what was going on. We had a voice in what flexibilities our community needed uh, most and now are happy that some things like telemedicine and paid sick leave for our attendants will not go away. We worked with our state health department as trusted advisors and a community voice and continued our strong relationship with the governor's office through our great friend and ally, Lieutenant Governor Diane Primavera. And during the pandemic, we saw the hiring of the very first policy person in the, dis in the governor's office on disability our own Josh Winkler. Our work is not done and we have to mourn the loss of so many people with disabilities that were killed in nursing facilities. And we must not rest until no person in Colorado ever uses the word nursing home and have to in the same sentence. The housing crisis is worse than ever before and finding new housing after an eviction or any time for someone with a fixed income or access needs is more challenging than ever. Pay for our direct service workers, like our attendants, is still way too low, 
and benefits, including paid time off, remain inadequate. The employment rate of people with disabilities remains embarrassing. So we learned this year how strong and resilient we are as a community. So let's watch this film and celebrate that. Celebrate 31 years where we have had the same rights as everyone else, as we used to say to boldly go where everyone else has gone before. Let's say happy birthday to the ADA. And let's thank our great representatives, such as Representative Ortiz and Representative Herod, who actually do represent us. Let's do that today. And then tomorrow, let's get back at it and put all of that strength to use to continue to elect good representatives to continue our fight until we do have true inclusion. I wanted to mention that the video will be in full audio with English captions and have a live ASL interpreter. There is Spanish captions and Jose will explain in Spanish in a second how to get to those. If you require the audio, audio interpreting or Spanish, you can go to CCDC's YouTube channel for those options and those links are in the chat. Um, and then at the end of the video, we're gonna hear from one of the documentary sponsors, um, Rocky Mount Health Plans. And we also wanna thank PBS 12. They're gonna be airing this documentary um, today and a few other times this week. We're really excited. We wanna thank CCDC member and volunteer lobbyist Fran Mays for making the connection and introduction. And I wanna thank our videographer, Alexander um, Manis um, for the great work. I've only seen a trailer, so I'm really excited personally to, to see this documentary. Um, Jose, can you explain in Spanish, please, how to get to the Spanish? Of course. Para ver este documental en, en español, con subtítulos en español, por favor, vean el video, visiten el link que tenemos en el chat. Ahí van a encontrar un video en YouTube que tiene subtítulos disponibles en español. Gracias. Okay, I think we're ready for the video. The disability that I live with is uh, paraplegia. It's Asia A T10 complete, so that's around the belly button level, paralyzed from the waist down. Um, and I came to that life uh, via a helicopter crash when I was deployed in Afghanistan. We had a catastrophic engine failure. We were right outside the base. Um, long story short, we made a hard landing. That's what they call a hard landing. And both of us luckily survived. There were three Kiowas. That was the airframe that I flew that went down that deployment. We were the only crew that survived. Um, I have a pretty complicated medical history, actually. But uh, the disability that has affected me the most has been epilepsy. I was born with a congenital neuromuscular disease called arthrogryposis. So it basically affects mostly my upper arms and hands. Um, but uh, also my legs a little bit too. My disability is that I struggle with depression, chronic depression and anxiety. If I'm autistic and I have um, a couple of autoimmune diseases, chronic illnesses. I have cerebral palsy. It does fix my legs, so it makes it hard for me to get around. Uh, I fell from a tree at the age of 21 and I uh, fell 40 feet and hit a big limb that was about 10 feet off the ground and crushed my pelvis and ripped my spinal cord in half. And, uh, and yeah, life changed at that point in time. My disability is a form of autism. It's called Asperger's syndrome. I had a stroke in the womb. The doctor said that I wouldn't be able to walk, wouldn't be able to talk, and that I'd have to be fed through a feeding tube. She's definitely progressed beyond a, a, a vegetable, what they said, and I, I was quoted once saying, you know, I'm not a gardener. I don't know how to raise vegetables, but I'm a mom and I know how to sure advocate for my baby girl. I was diagnosed when I was two years old with autism. So in the beginning of COVID, um, I, I was in second grade, then like COVID began and then like, and like we had to bring all of our like school stuff back home and I didn't even know why. And they told me COVID was happening. And then, and then I asked them, what is COVID? And then, and then they said COVID-19 was the most dangerous um, virus out there. 
the NBA announcing they are suspending their season until further notice. The annual Coachella Music Festival in California has been postponed. In Washington, the National Cathedral will be closing for at least two weeks. Here in the city of New York, the St. Patrick's Day Parade is canceled. California, Oregon, Washington State have now banned gatherings of more than 250 people. More than 6.6 million Americans filing new claims for unemployment insurance. And Dr. Anthony Fauci, director of the National Institute of Allergy. The World Health Organization has declared the coronavirus a global pandemic. I was feeling trapped in me in my apartment and being black and disabled. And I was basically scared to go outside. So we had been sent home from work, which was supposed to be temporary. And then I think it was that weekend, maybe, I was in line at the grocery store and it was the like most busy I have ever seen the grocery store. I sat on the floor and I started crying because I was like, what happened? I got the phone call saying, don't come in to work tomorrow. We are closed until further notice. I'd say there was um, a lot of uncertainty at that time. At first, we thought we would be disproportionately impacted because of the type of work that we do. And then within like two weeks, the whole world was shut down. The streets were just empty and there was nobody out and, and the big city was quiet. Everything just got so crazy. At one point in time, we had um, four family members in the hospital at the same time. Just, you know, the fear of the unknown. It was when I realized that the public health restrictions were going to inadvertently marginalize people who were already struggling to achieve independence and participate in community and freedom from isolation that I knew that it was going to be a serious thing. Hello, my name is Ian Engel, and I'm the executive director at the Northwest Colorado Center for Independence. Our mission is to support people with disabilities to live healthy and safe in our own communities. The steps we had to take to prepare for the pandemic were extensive. I had meeting after meeting after meeting of people trying to figure out how to work together through this, and it was a moving target. In the meantime, we're trying to continue to be a resource for some of the people who need it the most. We saw an uptick in suicides, mental health uh, needs on the rise, people stuck in their homes, afraid of this boogeyman. They don't even know what it is, when it's going away, or what to do about it. All they know is that we're locked down and isolated and trying to support people for our staff was, as you can imagine, the emotional bandwidth just got stretched. It was so taxing. My name is uh, Representative David Ortiz. I am the representative for House District 38, which is Littleton and the western parts of Centennial. Um, veteran, advocate, and lobbyist for veterans before I got elected. So for me, I know that I'm in the vulnerable community, so I, I took extra precautions not to be in public, to always mask up as much as possible. Um, you know, I was running for office at the time, so it meant adapting. But here's where the injury helped prepare me for that in a way, unintentionally was I spent six months as an inpatient in a hospital bed. So the only way I interacted with friends and family if they didn't come see me was via social media. So in a way, that six months of being inpatient prepped me and helped me and my team shift what we were doing during the campaign um, to set ourselves up for success during the pandemic. Because of COVID, every, I mean, a lot more was done virtually. In some ways, I could be more effective because I wasn't having to build in time for taking my chair apart, put it together, or anything else when it comes to self-care, living with this injury. I could do more um, with video conferencing. That being said, since everything was back to back to back, you would always leave the end of the day feeling more exhausted in some ways, and you never get the uplifting feeling of being around other humans, you know what I mean? So um, I think that was the, the biggest transition for me um, in this job going to, into a COVID. My name is Andrea Moore, and I'm the executive director and co-founder of a Denver-based nonprofit called The Wayfaring Band. Hi, my name is Brittany Murdoch, and I am a band member at Wayfair Band and a mixed media artist. Yeah, you're a beautiful mixed media artist with Access Gallery, also another local Denver nonprofit, and a band member with us. And I should tell people that you're not a rock and roll band member because we don't make 
music, right? We're not a rock and roll band and Britney is not a rock and roll queen, although she could be. But the Wayfaring Band is a band of travelers. We do immersive uh, learning opportunities and independent living skills through adventure travel. And our community is folks with and without uh, intellectual and developmental disabilities. One of the things that we noticed right away is that it, the people who were thrown early in the pandemic and who were really kind of panicking and losing it were all people who are neurotypical, right? So they don't have a cognitive disability and also who are like, you know, physically typical and don't have a physical disability. You know, all of the people who have been sort of privileged by, you know, our systems were freaked. And everybody we knew in the disability community was kind of like, okay, well, <laughs> here we go. We're going on another ride. So one of the first things that we did as an organization was we set up kind of like a community phone tree. It was, what do you need? Cool. Who's providing that service? Great. Let us just put A plus B and get you all together. And also I think it was just the social piece. Like, I don't know, Brittany, do you feel like socially your life changed? I feel like I was not really sociable. I feel disconnected. I used to see my family in person. So when I was not able to um, see them in person, it kind of affected me. I'm more a hands-on person and like to talk to you in person. I find me on video, but it's just, it makes my eyes hurt sometimes. Some of the people that we are, that are in our community you know, are really very drawn to routine. And so for a lot of folks, the uncertainty of those first few months, it was really throwing so many of the folks in our community who thrive on schedules and routine. Hello, my name is Seth Weschnick. I am a cashier at Arc Thrift Store in Lakewood, Colorado, and I have been here for nine years now. I started to realize that COVID was becoming serious. In all honesty, I started to see it as a little bit of a serious thing when we started having less customers here at the store, which was probably about maybe a month or two before we actually closed down. We were closed for the entire month from the end of March until the beginning of May. I worried about day by day what's going to happen. I focused on the fact of staying at home as much as possible. I literally was a couch potato for a month waiting to get a phone call to come back to work. This place is my home away from home. I never thought that it would have lasted as long as what it has, ever. Hello everyone, my name is Julissa Soto. I'm the director of statewide programs for Servicios de la Raza. When I re realized that the pandemic was getting serious is when I went to the store grocery shopping and everybody was going crazy and running one way to another and it, I started feeling anxiety because I couldn't find um, food I couldn't find anything so ah, that's when I started panicking when I couldn't bring food to my home and I was like wow in my mind I said this is ironic I crossed the border in the trunk of a car coming to a new country to live a better life but therefore, I felt that I was like in Mexico again with no food, panicking, starving, and, and, and nobody was giving us information. At the beginning, I felt defeated, very defeated. I had two choices, either fall asleep forever because I was sleeping and sleeping and being super depressed, or I had the other choice of getting out there and helping others who might not be able to even help themselves. I created um, a drive through food bank in, in El Paso County in Colorado Springs for the monolingual Spanish speaking community. So that would give me a lot of hope that I was giving food to those who number one, cannot afford to buy food and number two, that they were also scared and, they, and because of their status, they might be undocumented, they didn't know where to go. That made me realize that I was not alone in this and, um, and my depression and anxiety was not as bad when I was around people who were, who were struggling like myself. Hello, my name is Haven Ronert. I've been working for Safeway for 13 years. I'm a volunteer advocate with Colorado Cross Disability Coalition. I'm going to school full time and I'm highly invested in pursuing my local music career. 
I realized the pandemic was getting serious when stay-at-home orders were went into effect and when everyone at work got letters that we were essential workers so we could um, any authority figure that stopped us on the way to and from work we could uh, show them that we are essential workers and we uh, have a job to do. During lockdown I continued to work I just started school so that kept me occupied and like always I was very focused on my music. I'm used to be being very active uh, so not being able to go anywhere besides to and from work I had to get very creative. There were many days that I would get home from work and put my earbuds in and go out into my balcony and dance in the sunlight. Hello, I'm Alicia Wong. I'm a family medicine physician in Denver. Honestly, I took some solace in the fact that I could go to work every day and kind of contribute to whatever was happening. Um, and that felt like I was, I was doing something. I think the, also the, the indirect benefit of going to work is that I still had my social circle at work that I could see my colleagues every day. And so the social isolation, I didn't really experience as much, I think, as some of my other friends who aren't in healthcare or essential workers. And, um, that was helpful to me. I think, I think the camaraderie amongst everybody as well was really important because we were all living with this anticipatory anxiety, you know, the risk of getting exposed, um, infecting other people that we care about, that we live with. Um, so all of that. And so I think really just keeping in touch with my family and friends and, um, living day to day, kind of not trying to get too wrapped up in the uncertainty was how I dealt with everything. I think all healthcare disparities really kind of got accentuated during the pandemic. I think a lot of uh, the support systems for people with disabilities, for example, day programs, like they got canceled. And I think the social isolation and consequences of that um, were pretty devastating. I think also have, not having kids go to school was really difficult because a lot of uh, rehab services are through school and so I had a lot of patients who weren't getting OT, PT, speech because they weren't going to school in person um, and so I think those those things are in general or what I saw primarily certainly around the country um, and in the news and the media there's been a lot of discussions about like subjective uh, evaluation of quality of life and care rationing and um, that was definitely something that I was on my mind as a healthcare provider throughout the past year. Generally, healthcare needs to have better accessibility and tracking disability status, um, even accommodations really easily, um, implementing those accommodations, and then just general cultural competency for people with disabilities amongst healthcare professionals and staff and anybody who works um, and interacts with patients and their families. I think it's gonna be uh, the next probably 10, 20 years uh, to work on, but that's um, something that I'm hoping to change. Hello, I'm Deborah Johnson. I am the General Manager and the Chief Executive Officer for the Regional Transportation District here in Metropolitan Denver. I realized the pandemic was becoming serious. And let me qualify my response by saying I wasn't in the Denver area, I was in the greater Los Angeles area. And I realized it was becoming serious looking at the myriad of news reports and both Mayor Garcetti and the Board of Supervisors had put forward public health orders early on um, the first week in March, which was March 5th. I remember it as if it was yesterday. As related to my job, it, recognizing the role in which I play, it affected me in the sense of trying to ensure that our employees are safe and healthy. Uh, but then still having the great responsibility of delivering essential transportation services because while the world stopped, it didn't stop. We still needed to transport um, essential workers. We still needed to ensure that we could provide, you know, paratransit service, fixed route service. And so all of these things were prevalent in the sense that I ensured that I came into the office each and every day because being a leader of an organization, I want to model the behavior I want to see and if my teammates don't have another option of teleworking, I believe it's incumbent upon me to be present and be at the ready. As long as we have people on this planet, there's going to be a need for transportation. It may not be what we know it to have been pre-pandemic, but we'll still be here. 
And as we talk about what that is, I think if anything we've learned from this pandemic is to be flexible and agile because we have to be ready to pivot quickly. And so I think if anything, as we go forward, I believe that not everything will be done by texting. Uh, people are picking up the phone to engage and talk to people more. We recognize the importance of taking care of ourselves. Our health is our wealth. And I think there'll be a more laser focus on those elements as we go forward to really relish in the time that we have with our loved ones because there's this old adage, you can never be too busy to stop and get gas. And so as we look at what we're doing holistically, we need to reflect on what's most important to us as individuals. And so I think if anything, we as a society need to come to grips with that. Hello, my name is Claudine McDonald. I am the Community Relations Chief Executive for the Aurora Police Department. Hello, my name is Janae. I am an interventionist slash paraprofessional at Global Village Academy. Well, at the beginning of the school year, everybody was online and remote, so everybody had to do school online. But at like this, after the first or second semester, the kids, half of them came back in person and then half of them stayed at home. Like they had a choice. So that was like double the work. Really, we got busier because Obviously, that was at a time of need for our community. We did a survey and we saw, we asked our community, what is your biggest need right now? And it was, we need help finding jobs. We need help with our mortgage and our rent. And we need food. My team really focused on the food aspect. And so we uh, utilized our partners in the community and we um, utilized the CARES Act funding and we were pushing out um, food like crazy. You know, the nothing about us without us, is, it stands true. We cannot allow the world to move around us. We have to be part of the mix and we have to be part of, uh, of what is being built. Hi, my name is Zoe Collins. I use she, hers pronouns and I am the Director of Outreach and Communication at The Initiative. Uh, we're a small nonprofit and we do, we're statewide, and we do victim advocacy for survivors of all types of abuse and we specialize in working with survivors with disabilities. So in like all natural disasters is really where we have a lot of data around specifically do domestic violence, but I would extrapolate that it's like all types of violence. The pattern was kind of weird and it was different for different organizations too, which is super interesting, um, but we had I think a pretty sharp increase right at the beginning, but what ended up happening is we had an increase in crisis calls, but a decrease in long-term clients. The incidents of violence were more often and worse, um, but then people weren't able to like continue working with an advocate long-term the way that we usually provide services, and it is really hard um, to watch services um, shrink down when the need is growing. I think the way that disabled people have been treated in the last year um, has been very like openly terrible. The lack of the word disability in the last year in the mainstream like conversation is mind-blowing to me that we're talking about like mass disability right and nobody is saying that word like on the news um, are talking about how the pandemic is like extremely disproportionately impacting people with disabilities that we haven't even been tracking that number in the U.S. Even like the way that people would say things like, oh, it's just the elderly and disabled that will die. It's like, we're not a just. Hi, my name is Miles and I'm nine years old. It was really hard to go into remote class and then in person and then remote class and back in in person. It was just very stressful for me. Everything was starting to close and especially school. Everybody had to wear masks and six feet, which is absolutely annoying, washing hands for 20 seconds and <clears throat> with soap and water and sanitizing for tons of times and sanitizing makes my hands dry but like when it's gone i'm pretty sure everybody will be excited 
I'm pretty sure there's going to be humongous parade after. <laughs> Whoever is going to see this, just be patient with this able community. And um, I guess seek out support if you need help. It's okay to ask for help. What I'd like to see is the neurotypical and the able-bodied communities become more resilient. And I think that the way that we can do that is by uplifting the voices and lived experience of people with disabilities. and enabling them to be leaders in all of our journey towards resilience. I envision communities where there's all kinds of people, people with wheelchairs and blind and dogs and scooters and, aut and autists all hanging out and doing their thing in the community and it's business as usual. I think that there's a real opportunity moving forward for the disability community to showcase our resiliency. Um, by becoming more engaged. We need to be in unity. A lot of the times I feel that the nonprofits, we want to work solo and we need to unite efforts in order to impact communities and create changes. Do not be timid to advocate. Do not be timid to tell your story because unless any person that lives with a disability could be an elected leader, then we're not really caring about representation, are we? We're not really fighting for representation. Um, so just being unified with each other and making sure that we're empowering um, each other and ourselves to not be timid and to not be afraid to fight for that access and to push for that access, even if we have to have sharp elbows with it every once in a while. When you have a choice between being right and being kind, always choose kindness, because you never know what somebody's going through. My thing that I, that I always say is, I'm just happy to be here. I say it all the time. <laughs> Happy to be here. Just happy to be. <laughs> that was really incredible. Um, Wow. Um, I'd like to invite, um, I think, Patrick Gordon from Rocky Mountain Health Plans to share a few reflections. Hey, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thanks so much for the opportunity to be here with you today and to join in the celebration. Um, we at Rocky are very uh, proud uh, to partner with and, frankly, to follow the lead of CCDC and creating social justice uh, for everybody in our Colorado communities. Um, I'll just share a few thoughts about our work and our reflection on the past year. And uh, uh, I recently uh, have been kind of inspired by the words of Cesar Chavez um, uh, in his crusade for social justice. And I think it applies to uh, the mission that we all share here uh, in this community. The first thing that occurs to me reflecting back on the past year is that um, you know, something says our Chavez said is that you cannot oppress people who are not afraid anymore. When you think about the disability rights crusade, and you think about all that it has generated in the last 50 years, it's about fearlessness. It's about breaking boundaries. It's about breaking through uh, all of the illusions and all of the misunderstandings in our society. And, you know, for our part in our work and our partnership with CCDC, with, uh, CCDC um, You're on mute. Wow, I've been on mute for a few minutes here. My part, my my uh, my chief, excuse me for that. Um, I'll start over. Um, okay, so uh, first and foremost, I'm pleased to be with all of you guys this afternoon. Uh, very pleased uh, to share in the celebration. Uh, in reflecting on the work uh, that CCDC and all of its allies do in the community. I'm reminded of uh, the words that uh, Cesar Chavez shared 
uh, in his efforts uh, for justice. And first and foremost, uh, one of the quotes that resonates with me is that uh, you can't oppress people who are not afraid anymore. All of the work that CCDC has achieved uh, over the decades, well before the ADA was passed, uh, was really based on recognition that um, fear it is like shackles um, and that um, together we can overcome uh, injustice and misunderstanding by breaking through fear. And so we're very pleased, not just to partner with you all, uh, but to follow uh, the lead that CCDC creates in this community uh, in creating better opportunity uh, and equity for everyone. The other, the other quote that resonates with me, you know, thinking about uh, our work here together and the mission we share is that uh, no one is ever strong enough uh, not to need help. No one is ever strong enough that they don't need help. And, you know, help and health is not just about medical care. It's about the well-being of whole people and whole families and whole communities. It includes emotional well-being, spiritual connection and fulfillment, uh, financial and educational growth and opportunity, the opportunity to dream, the opportunity to try, the opportunity to fail, and through resilience to try again. Um, health is all of those things. And uh, we are very pleased to stand with CCDC and your mission, your efforts to create health for everyone. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to support and share in this celebration. Um, we are honored to be your partners. Thank you. And we really appreciate the work that we get to do with you all over the West Slope and Larimer County. Um, and so to wrap us up, I'd like to introduce the other co-chair of our board of directors, Brenda Mosby. Brenda, you're muted. You're still muted. Just a second. Oh, there you are. We can hear you now, Brenda. I think we lost Brenda. Brenda is frozen. Okay. I can hear her, but the, uh, her internet became really slow. Brenda? Well, um, what Brenda was um, going to do was to, um, was to just wrap up with, with some reflections and to thank everyone. Um, we really wanna thank everyone who was part of this video. Um, it, that was just amazing um, and really just demonstrated the amazing resiliency of our community. We wanted to thank all of our sponsors today um, for making this possible. We, again, we wanna thank uh, Channel 12. Um, we wanna thank Fran Mays for making the introduction and um, you know, talking to us about, we need to do a video, we need to do a video. So thank you, Fran. Um, and then all of our, all of our other sponsors, um, again, Arc Thrift and, and Rocky Mountain Health Plans were our, our champion sponsors, but we also wanna thank everyone else. Um, Colorado Access, Creek, um, Jose just took away all of the sponsors. You on, Brenda? Can you hear me? Yes, good. Oh, my goodness, sorry, oh, I, technology. Um, apologize. Um, thank you, Julie, for introducing me. I am the co-host of CCDC. 
And I want to thank everyone for being here for this, this resilient and amazing event that was conducted in one hour. How powerful is that? This is going to be our last gathering for the ADA celebration. And next year, I hope you're all applauding. We will be in person. I am so looking forward to that. You are more than welcome. We welcome you to join us. It is free to join. And you can just go online and join that way. You can also do a donation to CCDC. As you have heard, the work that is being done here and the people that are being affected here and the lives that are being changed and uplifted here, we donations should be pouring out of the sky for what CCDC has been doing for over 30 years. I also, they celebrated their 30th anniversary last year. Um, you can donate at www.ccdc.org slash donate. You're welcome to do that. And when you sign up as a member, you will get email alerts. You actually will have an opportunity to select what type of alerts you would like to receive. And the proceeds, as you you can imagine it goes to our advocacy, which is what is the foundation and flagship for CCDC. They know how to do it and they know how to do it well. I want to thank you to all of our sponsors, ARC Thrift Stores, Rocky Mountain Health, Health Plans, and Colorado civil rights, education, enforcement, Colorado housing is also a sponsor, finance, authority, PASCO, Art of Aurora is also there for us. Citywide banks, anonymous donate, donators that we have, Kilmer, Cumin, and Lane LLP, the Colorado Trust, Atlantis. Community, Colorado Children Campaign, Craig Hospital, Palco. We want to thank all of you for supporting our cause and for helping us to um, do the work that we do. I hope that um, each of you who are here today would um, ask for a copy. I believe this was recorded and to send this out um, throughout the city, the state, the country. This is something that should be heard by all. Thank you, Julie, for asking me to be a co-chair of CCDC. I do it with pride and I do it with honor. And with that, I will turn it back over to you, Julie. Thank you, Brenda. And thank you everyone for joining us. Um, with that, I want to thank everyone again for being here and wish everyone a very happy 31st uh, Disability Independence Day. Have a wonderful day, everyone.